welcome for the second day of the Fresh Web Radio Live. It is half past ten today in Bagneux. We are in Bagneux. It's next to Paris. It's 10 kilometers south to Paris. We are the 21st of September. Aude Lavigne speaking. I'm a French journalist. Be your guide. I'm your guide on your on this exclusive, uh, on your journey, I wanted to say, but on this exclusive web radio station, streaming live for Fresh Fresh. This is uh, meeting the event of Circo Strada's network, the network of uh, contemporary circus and outdoor arts, celebrating this year 20 long, beautiful years of uh, existence. Here we are in Bagneux, I told you, but uh, we are in a very, very special place. Beautiful, huge. It's called Le Plus Petit Cirque du Monde, the smallest circus in the world. And this is absolutely false. This is a lie, because it's not small, it's big. It's a big um, circus place that was made by the architect uh, Patrick Bouchin, who is an architect in France was used to, to make a cultural center. And this is a beautiful place in, in wood. We can see big pieces of wood in this uh, circle place, which looks like a, a triangle. And we are on the, in this triangle, but we are a circle in the triangle. And in the air, we can see another circle. It's beautiful, it's really beautiful. This is where is happening this morning, the second morning session of Fresh. And today, the main topic will be safety. Safety in this world of contemporary circus and outdoor arts. Yesterday, it was about care. And tomorrow, the topic will be about sustainability. As you know, there is always an order First, to start with a 20-minute keynote, and after there will be a half an hour artistic talks to artists. We'll talk about um, safety in the world, and there, there will be a, a round table. But a round table uh, we won't put on on stream because for um, safety reason, the panelist wanted not uh, to be recorded. So you won't uh, be able to listen to, to the last round table, but we will uh, invite and grab some uh, artists and people to talk for an exclusive moment on this uh, radio. We'll manage to catch everybody we want. As you know, it's not always very easy when you have this live moment, things are moving, and, uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll find a solution to make you listen to the maximum of what we can find for you. Thank you to be with us in air, listening to this web live streaming of Fresh Radio. We make it possible because we are working with uh, making waves, recording, and all around, streaming it all around the world for you that are not here. Let's listen to the entering of, of the audience here in Le Plus Petit Cirque du Monde in Bagneux. Listening to Fresh Wave Radio Live Stream 2023. We are in, in Bagneux, le plus petit cirque du monde. Yesterday we were in La Villette, Paris, and tomorrow we will be in the village de Cirque, where is in Paris. It is in Paris à la Pelouse Roy. Today it was raining 
never rains in Paris, but today it was raining. So we should have started uh, earlier. But because of the rain, there is more traffic. So we decided to wait a little bit to start the second morning station of Fresh. This is why you are listening to uh, the ground of the audience behind my, my voice. We are in this uh, beautiful place, as I, called you, the, as I told you, the smallest circus in the world. This is a new, not say new, but quite a recent, fresh uh, place. But the, the project of the smallest circus in the world is not uh, so new yet, or already has maybe around 30 years uh, age, years. And it's a specific uh, project with uh, circus classes. And it, it, it wants to make the link between the circus and the people, the circus and the city. And it's a, a fantastic uh, democratic project. You might uh, have a look on, on the website, Le Plus Petit Cirque du Monde. On the website also of uh, circostrada.org, you can uh, listen uh, to the streaming today and tomorrow again at 10 o'clock. You can follow what we are recording live for this morning session. And you can also have a look on the circostrada.org uh, about all the publication of, uh, of the network and also the previous broadcast that were made before the event and that are called Around Fresh and produced by uh, Make a Muse. And then you will um, be able to listen to different uh, podcasts about these different topics that are discussed uh, also during these days. It's to be safe, sustainability, and to take care, care, the notion of care, so important in this, um, in this world. On the website of circostrada.org, you may find also uh, documentation and uh, resources, and it's in English and in French. And after the event also of Fresh, you have to know that we will produce also a podcast of this uh, morning sessions and then also a book will be will be made uh, and will be um, able available in the beginning of uh, 2024 this is a, a publication on these three days and it is made with the collaboration of Sarah Bouchra so from now we are live and when it's live, you know, it's a moving time, so we wait for the, 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 the beginning of this second day. The first uh, person that will talk this morning for a 20-minute keynote to introduce the concept of safety is uh, Guillaume Dupuis. is uh, an associate teacher in Scientific uh, University of Orsay, and this keynote is always a, a dynamic Hello. brief. Oh, it's time to listen to. We are very happy to host you here today uh, to celebrate these 20 years of Circo Strada, and we are very happy to cross the, um, the borders of, the Par of Paris and to come outside of Paris to see how circus, outdoor arts are uh, working, are dealing with the territories, how artists are investing these spaces. So five minutes to tell some stories about what we do here. Uh, so first I would like, of course, to present you our um, uh, president, Daniel Forger. He's here, the founder of Plus Petit Cirque du Monde, and then uh, Elisabeth Fauvel. Uh, she's the deputy mayor for culture and uh, uh, the mayor could not come today, but has a, a walk welcome to, uh, to you. Uh, so Bagneux is a town of uh, 40,000 inhabitants, uh, uh, very, um, a very city with a lot of uh, history and uh, working class history. And uh, the circus came to town 31 years ago. 
So it's really a story of the territory. It's, it's a root grass, and uh, the name Le Plus Petit Cirque du Monde comes from this story because 31 years before, a small team uh, around Daniel, they founded this place. So, and tomorrow we start a new page because we got a national label and we'll go to open what we do now to heritage. What is the heritage of peripheral areas? What is heritage in disadvantaged areas? And how circus and outdoor arts can uh, bring and build new alliance in order to uh, give positive change in this area. So it's a very interesting subject. Uh, two years ago, we had uh, an important meeting with Chico Strada and the French Institute in Alice uh, about art and territories. And uh, this year we have also uh, um, a um, Spark event in LFC. Now you can find, of course, uh, uh, information on the Circo Strada website about uh, what can, uh, positive change can we bring in a town like LFC in Greece, an industrial town, but also a space for heritage. So we will be here uh, the whole morning, and in the afternoon there will be three paths. So this day we have uh, really built it with our very close partners, Lazimut, so the whole team is almost there. And uh, uh, Lazimut is a national circus uh, center called National Cirque, and we work closely in order to do what? First, to support young artists, especially young emerging artists, of course older artists too, but we focus on young artists. So here is a place for residencies, and you will have the occasion to meet some of them, we have an incubator, it's called Pépinière Premier Pas, and so it's uh, the idea how can we support them. We host both French and, of course, a lot of European and international artists with a focus also to um, territories that are uh, out of Europe. Uh, the second uh, important uh, point is uh, the territory. So we work a lot with the communities. We are in the middle of uh, uh, quite disadvantaged areas, 70% of public housing. And so we do a lot of outreach and artistic education, both with circus, hip hop, parkour, free running, and now more and more with also architecture, uh, ecological redirection, and um, urban planning. Uh, we do a lot of community events. Uh, we are also a space uh, where we can um, not only program our artistic uh, project, our artistic uh, programmer, Gaëtan Levesque, is not here, but we can meet him tonight with the show Esquive that is going to be presented at uh, Théâtre de la Piscine at uh, Lazimut. And the third part, uh, you will have enough time, the, um, one of the paths to discover, it's called Le Lycée Avant Le Lycée, it's the high school before the high school. It's part of our work with architects. It's the idea how a circus community, a music community, a dance community, and citizens can work together with uh, uh, public and private stakeholders to build a high school. How, how can we build a high school here in the disadvantaged area and make it an, a space for opening education, how art can influence all this part? So we'll have enough time uh, this afternoon to discover. And of course, I would like to thank the whole team of uh, PPCM that have facilitated all this part and that is uh, are run running this uh, Project so we can meet uh, all around uh, uh, today. Uh, Mathilde, uh, uh, Lucille, uh, Catherine, the whole technical team, and all the people that are, are working here. So, five minutes is already gone, and uh, we'll be happy, of course, to uh, give you more information, to give you a tour. You can have also our information, our newspaper. Thank you, and please enjoy your day. And we hope that uh, the rain will clean our territory, and this afternoon we can enjoy all the paths. So uh, let's enjoy this second day of celebration. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Lefterius. Thank you, Le PPCM, for hosting us. And thank you also, Lazimut, for building also together with us this second day. How are you doing? OK. How was the party last night? Okay, who forgot this on the boat? <laughs> Anyone? I'll keep that. Okay, we'll post a picture on the WhatsApp group. Otherwise, I will keep that in Paris. You think you know? Okay, we'll give it to you then. Okay, so thank you so much for waking up, for being 
almost on time for braving the traffic. Uh, we're so happy that you can see and discover other parts of Paris and the region. Um, sorry for the rain and the accident on the street, but these were beyond our control. And we have another little issue for this morning, so sorry to say. We, um, we invited Guillaume. Guillaume Dupuis is a professor at university in optics in a very important university in the south of Paris. We invited him because he is also in charge of international relations and also because he is uh, uh, is chairing the office for um, inclusivity, diversity and equity at the university. Unfortunately, uh, Guillaume couldn't be with us this morning. So we had to reschedule a little bit and uh, we called uh, a friend of his. Um, her name is uh, Poulette and uh, Poulette will be with us this morning. So please let's give Poulette a big round of applause. Okay, let's encourage her. So Poulette. Are you hearing me? Yes, I can hear myself, so that must mean that you are hearing me. Um, so, as Stefan introduced, uh, my name is Poulette Havekiki. See the, the pun I did here? Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Stefan and the organizers for inviting me to present this expose today. Uh, I'm going to try to explain to you how uh, safe spaces work. Um, and I would also would like to underline the fact that, um, for once, uh, the drag queen was on time and the public was late. So I know it's not your fault, but just, I just wanted to you know, start with that because it doesn't happen quite often. Um, next slide, please. Yes, so this is the guy who was supposed to be here today. I forgot to put his pronouns, but he's he, him. So as Stefan explained, he's a professor in optics, and he works a lot of other stuff at the university that makes sense for the expose today. But I'm not this guy. Uh, I'm this woman. Um, so my name is Poulette. You can see my credentials up there. Almost all of them are true, um, almost. Um, and uh, the question I want to address right now is uh, whether I feel safe with you today. And um, right now I do, because I'm, I have a lot of light. I don't see you really. And I'm on a stage, meaning that this is my space and I can do pretty much everything I want. But when it comes to getting here, and I know that you had trouble getting here as well. Next slide, please. I wanted to show you a picture of my dear friend Enza Fragola. So this is not me here. I know we kind of look alike because we have like mustaches and beard, but we're not the same person. And the main difference that we have is that she takes the metro to go to a gig, which I don't, because I'm not crazy. And I don't feel safe in the metro. She takes the metro so often that the system for public transportation in Paris used her in the, their advertising campaign. So there are some pictures of her in some metro stations because she's that famous. We call Enza and the others who take the metro the subway queens. So Enza is a subway queen. <clears throat> but I don't feel safe in a metro. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> in order for me to feel safe, I need to be surrounded by other cross-dressers, basically. And when it comes to other cross-dressers, of course, there is a long history of cross-dressing drag queens, drag kings, stuff like that. Um, but in terms of picture, I'm pretty sure you know about this one. This is a 
series of pictures that were taken by, by Brassai in the early 1930s. And he was going to, I don't, I don't know where, next slide, <laughs> where is she? I don't see her. She's there, yeah, thank you. So next slide, well, perfect. So these pictures by Brassai were taken from um, a ball that, had, uh, that happened every year uh, for Mikarem. Uh, and as you can see, um, the idea of this ball was to cross-dress. And this, the fact that everyone was cross-dressing create, created a safe space where it was okay to show something that you usually wouldn't show. And what's more interesting, I think, is the fact that when you look at the kind of people that were there, they had, they had this common thing of cross-dressing, but other than that, they were very different from one another. And if you look at the journals from this period describing the kind of crowd that was there, I have uh, this, uh, no, back, <laughs> thank you. Uh, as you can see, uh, there were the cream of Parisian queers, regardless of class, race, and age. Every category came from faggots, cruiser, I can say faggot, I have a gay friend, okay. Um, all queens, don't see why I should consider that. Um, so basically poor people, rich people, everyone. So what I think um, what we should learn from that is that when you when you start to create an environment when you, you don't mix people, meaning it's, an, it's a space where the non-mixity is the fact that you have to be a cross-dresser, then you, have, you open the, the door to a new kind of mixity that wasn't possible. These people would never have met one another if it wasn't for that kind of ball. So this was a French example. There is also an American example. Um, of that kind of a safe space, which was, well, you all heard about Stonewall, so I choose another one because, you know. Um, so this one is Compton Cafeteria. It's, was in, it's in the Tenderloin in San Francisco, and this picture, I think, is from 1966. Yes, and this was not even a ball. It was just a cafeteria where drag queens and trans people could just, like, have coffee, which is kind of great. <laughs> um, and they look pretty safe right there, having fun and drinking coffee in full drag. But next one. Um, as, as you may or may not know, uh, Compton Cafeteria was actually one of the first raid of police in the US, even before Stonewall. So it was safe inside, but if the police decided that it wasn't okay, then it wasn't safe anymore because you have to make sure that you have a continuity of your safe space, although it do doesn't work. <clears throat> so this is something that we queer people know about, like the queer places are the places that we look for when we want to feel safe. Uh, but in terms of, it's more like some sort of a reptilian strategy, to just try to avoid trouble. But when it comes to um, trying to theorize that kind of stuff, what, what it means, what, what, what is a safe space? How does it work? What are the rules? Uh, what are the objectives of a, of a safe place? Ironically, the first one to th theorize it was Kurt Lewin in the early 1940s. And you could think that it would be like to help some sort of minority that was in trouble, but no. All the, the theory that he came up with was actually designed to, for, for corporates, to make the companies work better. And not, not even the workers, but actually the managers, because the managers were having trouble to express themselves. They, were, um, they feared that they would be judged. They feared that they would be perceived as the bad guy. So they, the managers, <laughs> You need some sort of a safe space where, it, where they could complain about the workers and um, be mean uh, in order to uh, get rid of that together and then go back to the workplace and 
pretend to be nice managers again. So this, well, this is a bit a caricature what I'm describing, but it's, it's actually true. It was designed for the managers. I learned a lot of stuff when I prepared this expose. <laughs> um, so this is called sensitivity training, and it was like, it, it, it's a whole theory. They, they built a whole lab around it in Harvard, I think, well, somewhere in New England. Uh, and that was in the late 40s. Next one, please. So here are some uh, rules, how it worked. This, this is a picture of Kurt Lewin. And as I said, the idea of these groups were uh, the space where people could give their honest feedback to each other uh, without fearing of being judged. But that was only for the workplace, and the, the, uh, the idea be behind that was to create the environment for productivity to increase and not people to feel better, ironically. So when it came to realizing that you could actually use that kind of method to try and make people feel better in their everyday life, we have to thank, well, we have to thank the gays and the women, of course, but like for the theory, um, the, the guy who came up with that uh, was Carl Rogers, and he invented in the early 1960s what's called person-centered therapy. So it's, it's some form of psychotherapy where you uh, create a space with your therapist where the therapist is not going to judge you for whatever you're going to say. So you can feel completely free to um, say whatever you go through at one point in your life. But the, and the idea is that the relationship that you develop with your therapist in that particular context is much more efficient in terms of helping you uh, reach the goal that you have of feeling better at the end of the therapy. So um, the key points of this is that, uh, well, in the, the way he theorizes, the way he thinks it, um, is to, uh, first of all, you have to want to uh, be better and feel better uh, in order for to op open yourself up to say whatever goes through your mind and not, not feel judged by, well, not fear of, of being judged uh, by it. So he sums it up with three condi conditions eventually, which are empathy from the therapist towards the patient, uh, genuineness, meaning that you have to be genuine and authentic, uh, when you say whatever you're going through as a patient. And uh, the therapist is supposed to have some sort of a non-conditional positive uh, look towards whatever you're sharing with him. And that's how this uh, kind of um, person-centered uh, therapy was started to be the first theory of safe space as a way to improve not the productivity of your company or your man managing skills, but like your, yourself. Um, next one. But like when I, when I was doing research about this presentation, uh, the, the thing that I found most interesting was um, what is called consci consciousness raising, and this is a term that was invented by uh, women's liberation groups, mostly in the U.S., but but also I'm sure in France I, and other countries. I just didn't find any sources on it that I could show you. <coughs> so this is one of those uh, groups uh, of women uh, that were trying to. Um, raise awareness among themselves of the, the things that it w they were going through as a woman. And uh, so they were, next one. 
there are um, a lot of rules for it to work, and there are a lot of pamphlets that you can find uh, on the internet and on specific libraries. And I really encourage you to look at them because it's it's really simple. It makes complete sense, and 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 I will come back to that at the end of my presentation, but I realized that what they came up with is something that, uh, they came up with that like 50 years ago, right? It's something that somehow I had to re rediscover myself when I was trying to introduce it in my, the way I practice my teaching. Okay, I'm also Guillaume. I just, I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure it was, you know, uh, clear. But I guess now it is, right? Okay. Um, so really, I encourage you to to look for those and try to read them because it's it's. You, well, I learned a lot, and I realized that I was already doing most of the stuff just by trial and error, right? So what are the rules? Next one. Um, so the rule for this meeting was first of all, you have to select a topic. The topic is going to be what you're going to be discussing during the, the, the meeting. Of course, they recommend uh, topics that are related to women's uh, issues, uh, health issues, but also work issues, stuff like that. But like, to be honest, it works for every kind of issues. Um, you can go around a circle, and you, the idea is to always speak personally from your own experience. Never interrupt someone else, which I'm happy you are doing right now, not interrupting me. That's really sweet. Uh, never challenge anyone else's ex experience because like, it's their own experience and you can have an opinion of it, but you cannot, exp well, you cannot change it just based on your opinion of it. Um, try not to give advice. And at the end of the meeting, you try to sum up everything that was discussed after every woman had a chance to share her experience. Um, next one, please. So um, the idea of these women's group is are, it's, it's based on non-mixity, right? So in order for this honesty to happen and the no judgment kind of uh, policy of the safe space, you had to be only um, among women. So, of course, um, that, well, the Americans, they, they didn't like it. And I'm going to start with the Americans, but don't worry, I will end up with the French because we don't like it either. Well, I, I do, but like French people usually don't. So, you can find a lot of kind of that kind of images where you see that the men fear that the women are going to like take the power and steal the power from the the men which should be what well, was apparently very scary next one um, also um, the Americans they well for good reasons they have this trauma cultural trauma about segregation, and when you uh, go back to trying to uh, create some sort of a safe space, um, for, for instance, in this university, they were trying to create uh, dormitories only for black people, because black people didn't feel safe around white people, not the other way around. Black people were um, African American people, they were um, traumatized by all the microaggressions of racism they were um, experiencing every day. So they just wanted to have some sort of a, a space where they could at least spend time together and sleep and live without having to deal with the, the fact that white people are completely ignorant of the kind of problems they go through as African Americans. But th this triggered uh, some sort of a memory of segregation where you had places where only 
white people could go and places where only um, um, well, the other color, I don't remember what is, which one is it, but anyway. Um, so segregation, ooh, um, scary. Next one. And yeah, the last problem that the American have with that kind of safe space is the, the fact that it, 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 it doesn't go with their idea of uh, free speech. Because of course, if you start to uh, pay attention to the kind of things you say because you don't want to offend other people, then you, well, at least for this guy, Brett Easton Ellis, who published this book called White, uh, yeah, obviously he's white uh, and he's a man. Great. Um, I think I have some, uh, like, next on the next one, I have some really chosen pieces of this book. So he basically he sum sum up he sums up in this uh, in this book that I don't recommend. Um, Everything that is really bad with the new way of uh, thinking about uh, safe spaces, the idea that uh, you tend to, like wanting to surround yourself with people that are a bit more like you than people who are a bit like very different like you. And he's, he goes into a long rant about, well, I, I, I think it's the next one. Yeah. He wanted to be challenged. He learned a lot by being challenged by other cultures, other uh, writers, other pieces of cinema, music, whatever, whatever. So it's great. He wants to be challenged. But like, he's a white male, straight on top of it. So, I mean, like, of course, he would want to get challenged because. Well, he's not challenged ever in his regular life. So, I mean, like, good for him for wanting to be challenged. I, I mean, I guess it's better than people who, white, male, straight, who don't want to get challenged. But still, um, the, the people from the minorities, they get challenged even when they don't want to be challenged. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because it's it's just like, Everything is designed uh, to work for white, male, cisgendered, straight guy, right? So uh, for these people, everything is a lot easier than it is for um, others. And I, I think it does make sense that uh, people from minorities would want to be at some point in a space where they can a bit relax just from the outside world because the outside world is not nice. I mean, like, when I was walking from my car in full face earlier today, before you arrived, well, I mean, like, it's fine. Nothing happened to me, but, like, the, the way people were looking at me was not really nice. And, I mean, I'm used to it, so it's fine, but I, like, White, white male guys, they don't, they don't get that kind of stuff, you know? So, anyway, um, enough about the Americans. Let's talk about the French now. So recently, in France, we had this uh, woman journalist from Le Point, I think, and Marianne occasionally, both of which are um, kind of conservative newspapers and news magazine. She published a book about uh, safe spaces and non-mixed non environment, uh, especially in minorities, especially in queer minorities, and, and more specifically in queer people of color uh, minorities. And it's called uh, The New Inquisitors. Undercover investigation in woke territory. So she went undercover in woke territory. And do you know how she decided to go undercover? She did this. Hannah. 
She did this. As a drag queen, I feel very attacked by this. Because like, like nothing about this makes sense. The wig is crusty, first of all. It's obviously cheap. The contouring is really bad. I don't know what she did with her brows, but it... And the, there is some sort of glitters. I don't know if you can see it, but it, it doesn't work. And the flowers on the shirt, I mean, no. So with this outfit, she went undercover in um, um, the organization of um, something called uh, the Radical Pride, which is uh, um, a pride that is not as uh, mainstream as the regular pride, and especially this pride is designed for uh, people of color and trans people who often don't get to be at the front of the, the march, uh, the day of pride, because they, they are not um, gay or lesbian in, in, a, in a way that straight people tend to accept more. Uh, so she went into this organization called Pride Radical, and she came up with like really scary stuff. Uh, first of all, when you meet people in the, this Pride Radical movement, people ask you for your pronoun. I mean, it's, and apparently it traumatized, it traumatized her. The fact that she had to uh, take into account the fact that um, it would help some people to share the fact that the pronoun that they use on a day-to-day -day life is not the pronoun that they were assigned to at birth. The fact that she had to do that as well, um, that was something that traumatized her. Anyway, what else? Uh, oh yeah, she had a trouble with the fact that she was white. <laughs> and as a white person in a, in a radical movement that was specifically designed for people of color, queer people of color, to be in the front of the scene instead of in the background, as they usually are, she was shocked that she had to be in the background for once. And she published a whole book about that. And not only she published a whole book about that, but she was on every TV interview about that kind of stuff. With this crusty pink wig. I mean, like, no. Um, as a drag queen, I, I, I don't allow it. So anyway, um, this is the only example I took from the French uh, trouble with the, the, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, but there are a lot of um, other examples. Um, I just took this one because of the pink wig, obviously. It's just like, um, but the, the thing that they have in common is that in France we tend to uh, um, have this ideal version of, we call it universalism, meaning that, well, basically we don't see color, we don't see gender, we don't see whether you're straight or, um, si well, or straight or gay or lesbian or whatever. Uh, but that's just the idea. The, the truth is we actually do. <laughs> and we, more than that, we act on it usually in a bad way. Uh, sexist practice are the rule in the workplace. Um, homophobia is also the rule in the workplace. And in like every kind of spaces that it's not designed to be a safe space as, as is the subject of today. So I don't know, where am I on time? It's, what? It's time to wrap up, so perfect. So, the next slide was my take home message, so I guess it was indeed time to wrap up. So I did this bit of, a, I, I, I went back to this uh, pamphlet from the Women's Liberation Group from the 1970s, I think they were, they were from New York, but uh, there were similar ones um, 
all over New England in Harvard and so on. Uh, and I like this is actually written in the pamphlet. And uh, so as I said, when you want to create an, an environment where people can feel safe to share their experience and grow from that and try to um, see the kind of um, connections that can be made with your own experience with the experience of someone else. The rules are as follows. As I said, always speak personally, don't interrupt, never challenge anyone else's experience. Try not to give advice. That is something as a professor, which is sometimes really hard to do. But as a drag queen, I realized when I started drag that, that people had this um, capacity of always telling me how to, how to make my wig, whether I should wear nails, my nails are fierce, right? Whether I should wear nails or not, whether I should wear this dress or cinch my waist. Or, so I, when you present yourself in drag, I, like maybe some of you do that sometimes, you will notice that the people just give you more advice than they would when you present yourself as a, as, a, as a dude. So learning from that experience in my teaching practices, I try not to give advice anymore, unless it's asked for, of course. Um, of course, you have to sum up in the end. And I just wanted to add, add two things um, that I do as well. Um, so, uh, as I said, I am a professor in optics, and in optics we work in the dark most of the time. So when I'm teaching a lab session with students, um, when I enter the room, the room is completely dark. And some uh, recently, we, we, and also, yeah, um, and also my, my job is very manual. I have to align optics in a very specific way for it to work. So when a student is not doing it properly in the dark, because we work in the dark, I have to sometimes take their hands and like put them in the right position and help them feel the way it was it supposed to be done. And it's, it's starting to create issues among the students. I mean like, and, I, and now I understand why, because I'm actually touching them, it's, 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 a, it's a teaching practice because it's the only way you can learn, but I am touching their hands. Um, so it's, it, I mean, I understand how they can feel weird. Um, so we, we discussed a lot about it among the other professor and we decided that now, because we know we have to do it, so, so, so now we will enunciate it. Everything that we do, we, before we do it, we say that we are going to do it. And that helps a little bit. I can, I can see now that the, especially the female students, they, they used to be very scared about going to lab sessions. And to be honest, I know most of my straight colleagues, I would be scared of being in a dark room with them. Anyway, other question. Um, but they, they feel better now. Um, and the last one I wanted to say is, uh, as a performer this time, <clears throat> well, it works as well with students. So uh, with students, I tell them, okay, is it okay if I take your hand and put it on the, the lens? And okay. But as a performer, sometimes when you improvise something, especially in a drag bar or whatever, with people from the audience, which I won't do today, don't worry. Uh, you have to check for consent. And also check for consent means you have to enunciate what you are about to do and check whether it's okay or not to do it. So, well, uh, I'm not giving you advices because, well, you're not supposed to, right? Uh, but this is just what I do as a teacher and as a drag queen. And I think that's it. Thank you very much.
just we're happy to have a bullet with us and I can see I we have to we have to talk like that okay. because uh, I have the feeling that there is a performance but as we are on the radio okay, web that's stream the audience that's fine. the audience can't can't can see the Okay. Performance so we, we, we can do ASMR for a while. Yes, it's it's kind of sexy, this way of talking. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Because uh, it's not easy, as you as you say, to, to present ourselves in a drag queen outfit. Yeah. We can describe it a little bit. You have a beautiful uh, kind of Mondrian. <laughs> it's it's exactly a Mondrian dress. It's it's a replica of. Uh, an Yves Saint Laurent dress that was already based on, on Mondrian. And I have the matching nails, as you can see. Yeah, beautiful. It, uh, it's, it must take time. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't do them. I have a friend who does nails and she did them for me. Okay, and you have um, blonde and brown uh, yes. hair. Yes. Blonde and brown bob. Yes. And blue. So I, I'm not very good in makeup. Yes. I have a blue cut crease and a red lips. But it's very interesting here because you are, in a way, as you we listen to you, you are Guillaume Dupuis, a teacher in optic in the mm. dark places. Yes. And you are also uh, Poulet. Uh, Poulet have a kiki. Yes. It's the first time you do a conference in Poulet? Yes. I, I, I've been... Poulet has been alive for about eight years now. Uh, but it's the first time I'm doing something that looks like the kind of job that I have as a scientist, because I do a lot of presentation as a scientist. But it's my first one doing it in drag, which, which was very scary. I guess. Uh, but um, the organizers told me that the, the audience was really nice and really happy, happy about how the thing was um, taking place so and nobody knew that I was going to be in drag so I knew I had the like the surprise element to make it work so yeah I hope it was okay <laughs> of course it was fantastic and also we can hear in your voice the the tension and the kind of dangerosity we can feel when we expose ourselves yes yes Yes, there is um, every time. Uh, every time I do drag, now um, I don't do it the way I did it today. I always ask for um, a room for me to prepare myself and get in full face at the place where the, the gig is happening. I don't. I don't do. A, I told I don't do the metro. I don't yeah, do taxis. Don't, yeah. I just I just want to be. I arrive as a Guillaume and I transform into Poulette on site, and then I will remove everything and take my car and go back to my place. But today I I couldn't do that because it takes me um, two and a half hours to transform. And I was supposed to start at 10, and they don't open until 8.30, so I just didn't have the time to do it here. So what I did is I did the makeup at my place, and then I took my car and drove an hour to get here and walked from my car up to here. And still, this was the, the, I was okay in my car, to be honest, but like the moment from my house to my car and then the, the moment from the my car to here these well this is the moment i don't like ah. you talked about places you talk about light and we know your optic yeah. teacher so let's talk about it because you talk about safe spaces yes so the space is important yes the light is important yes. the dark is a danger but it yeah. can be also a security yeah, yeah. And uh, what is important to be see, seen or to see people? What makes you more into a vulnerability? Like it, when you're in the street, do you fear more the fact to be looked at or you to look at other people? 
I I don't I don't uh, like ironically I don't like I don't like to be looked at uh, except when I'm on Whoa! Oh. We do the live streaming and there is a performance behind. Let's listen a little bit. Sorry. Excuse me, is it possible I can come in the area closer to you guys? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Whoa. This is never before seen ever. Because a couple of seconds ago, they were close to the ground. Now they elevate in. It's like they're in a different world. Jesus Christ, help me. Hold on. I go on this side because I need to ask them a question. Hold on. Excuse me. Excuse me. Do you guys understand what's going on here? What you doing? We continue. Yes. Okay. We, could, we can see in the circus place, uh, it's a trio. Yeah. Two boys on the ground, two men on the ground, oh, and a third man making comments about them. Let's continue. It okay. was so cool. Let's go. Uh, uh, let's fit. Yeah, so you'd say, ironically, you don't like to be seen. No, I don't, I don't, I don't, like, I don't like to be seen um, on, a, on a street, like, for instance. Uh, I like to be on scene when I'm on stage, either here as a drag queen or as a as as a professor as well, because we are on on the stage. As yeah, a of course. It's it's a sort of performance as well. It's um, Hello, you have to, uh, uh, you have to uh, every, everyone uh, is supposed to be looking at you and listening to you, and so yeah, it's it's a performance, yes. and this is this is fine. And to 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 go back to your question. I <laughs> okay, this is You're for welcome. you. This is your moment. What was I saying? I don't remember. So that's a dedication, but the light, dark light or light? Yeah, and yeah, well, yeah. So, so and I, I try not to look at people too much as well because I know it can make them uncomfortable so yeah but I, like sometimes you not give advices yeah. we continue thank you so much to You're join welcome. us live stream fresh second day that will be the second moment of the artistic talk let's listen uh, my name is May uh, it says Oshan May later up there but I do prefer to be known as May and I'm Daria we're very happy to be here and glad that everyone made it despite the party last night and the rain. Yeah, yeah. I'm very thankful to be here. Yes, thank you for the invitation to be here and thank you for everyone for coming to listen to us talk. <laughs> so, um, as Stefan said, we are both artists and um, safety isn't necessarily our expertise. Um, so preparing for this talk, we, we started to think about what safety means to us and how, um, how do we incorporate or how do we think about safety in our artistic processes. Um, yeah, so like Daria said, we're no experts on safety, um, but uh, we are here to hold a conversation. Um, and uh, we've had a few conversations prior to being here today where we've started the discussion around safety in our own work. Um, and we're here to continue that conversation. And it's, uh, we're here to offer questions, um, things for you to think about, uh, things for us to think about, um, and reflections on, on what safety means. Yeah, a small window into a very big topic. Yes. So through these conversations, we came up with three um, key terms that we felt were uh, coming back the course of our meetings. And the first was familiarity. Yeah, the second was communication. And the third was respect. 
And we will, um, in the next 30 minutes or so, we will um, touch on these themes through the lens of our uh, respective works. So we will show you some slides eventually and talk about this too. Um, but so before doing that, um, speaking about familiarity, um, I've done this before in the dive um, event that Stefan uh, mentioned. So I would like to invite everyone to stand up, please. I'm going to put this on the side. Yes. Lovely seeing people stretch out already. It's yeah, really nice. <laughs> yeah, and so we're going to start also with um, familiarizing ourselves with the space. Um, so I invite you to, to look around to this amazing space that we're in here today. To the side. And May and I also um, familiarizing ourselves with this space, since we're also new here, and wanting to feel safe as well. And take a moment to also check in with your breath. Maybe you are holding some tension, maybe you're rushing, or maybe you're just sitting for a while and need to let something out. And I was introduced a while ago to this concept of power poses. Maybe some of you are familiar with this. So I'm just going to introduce one today. Um, so it's pretty much just having your arms out. You're going to be sort of like in an X. So have your legs slightly apart. Watch out for your neighbors. Safety first. And we're just going to hold this position just for a little bit. Feel free to close your eyes or leave them open. And on your next breath, feel free to start lowering your hands. If you had your eyes closed, feel free to open them and shake it out a bit. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. And take it away. Um, you can sit down now. <laughs> if you want to, you can stay standing if that's what you desire to do. <clears throat> Um, so I'm going to lead you through a short exercise. Um, so once everyone's settled back in their seat, um, a very short exercise just so we can all check in with ourselves today and hear how we're feeling, um, check in with the space that we're in and also check in with each other. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is to quickly just look around the room and spot five things that you can see and list them in your head Note them, become present in the space, so you're just finding five things. It could be a lamp, the screen, Daria, myself. Then four things that you can hear. And I tend to not talk during that one, so you can all listen. <laughs> um, and then three things you can feel. So it could be the clothes against your skin. It could be a breeze from the air con. It could be your feet inside your shoes. And 
looking to your right and then to your left, whichever this person, um, we'd like you to introduce yourself to the person next to you um, and maybe just tell them what you felt, what you saw or what you heard, just to check in with them. Lovely. Thank you. You could bring your attention back to the space and um, I hope you've had conversations, lovely conversations going on. <laughs> lovely. Thank you very much. We're just going to Bring that back into the space. Nice. It's really lovely to see, yeah, everyone uh, chatting actually, and already feel more comfortable and feel safer. Um, yeah, with your presence in the room. Um, so we're going to do introductions, uh, our introductions. Now that you've introduced yourself to each other. Um, so I'm Oshan Mailer. <coughs> My pronouns are he, they, and I'm a dance artist and choreographer from Wales, and thank you. <laughs> um, and I work as a choreographer and a performer. Um, I create work uh, for the outdoors. Um, I also uh, tour my work um, in the UK and internationally, um, and I'm very delighted to be here. Nice to meet you, mate. <laughs> I am Daria. Um, I'm a maker and mover, um, so I work with materials and with the body as a material. I work cross-disciplinary, so within different contexts, um, moving through circus, visual arts, and uh, performance arts, I would say. I mainly present work in um, non-conventional spaces, so work a lot outdoors, in industrial spaces, um, never really in, any, in a black box. And I work a lot also with, um, in, with participatory methods, so considering how I can engage the audience or work um, with the audience in other ways. I am currently based in Stockholm. Um, whoa. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I am from Jerusalem originally. Lovely. Thank you, Dalia. Um, I think we're, are we ready for our first slide? That was dramatic, wasn't it? Just <laughs> <laughs> um, so we are going to be introducing the topic of safety through introducing um, our work. And the first work that I'd like to talk to you about today is a work called Querin. Um, Querin is a work I created back in 2021 as a commission from Articulture. And um, Querin is a contemporary dance uh, theatre performance uh, for the outdoors and it's the first work that I um, it's the first work that I created <laughs> um, apart from a solo that I made on myself a few years before but for, for the first mid-scale um, production that I created um, and that was for the outdoors um, so I had I had a lot to learn um, so Querin is uh, inspired by traditional Welsh folk dancing um, I grew up uh, around folk dance in Wales. Um, my family is a family of folk dancers, and um, that has grown to become a big influence on my contemporary practice. Um, so Querin uh, takes uh, steps, patterns, and structures from traditional Welsh folk dance, um, and having played and sort of ruptured those patterns, um, taking inspiration also from uh, queer club culture. Um, so I'm looking at uh, the intersections between what it means to be Welsh, but also what it means to be queer. And I guess the, 
um, what I'm going to talk about is um, the, pres the presentation of queer bodies um, in, in public spaces. Um, it was great to hear uh, Paulette talk, um, talk a lot about that, actually, in, in the talk this morning. Um, but um, what I was interested in, and having, having been presenting this work, um, was how do we how do we protect um, those identities and how, when you're, when you're working with themes that are, um, as, as an artist, as a queer artist, my work will always be inherently queer, um, seeing the world through a queer lens. Um, but how do we um, present work that explicitly deals with themes um, and issues um, around this topic? Um, and uh, there are safe spaces for these um, identities to exist and to congregate. Um, and it's uh, important that those spaces are preserved um, and um, that communities can have a space, minority community, communities have a space that is safe for them to be in. But in uh, this particular sector, we often present uh, work in public places and I guess the question that I'm bringing up is how do we, uh, how do we take steps to make sure that, um, that we're safe? And how do we take steps to make sure that um, we, yeah, we protect, um, protect these bodies and identities in these spaces? Um, I was thinking back to a rehearsal that I did of the work quad in, um, in Cardiff and we just took it outside because we needed to get, um, get used to be, be doing it on different terrains. Um, and we had a group of uh, young, uh, young boys around 15, 16 years old. Um, they had bikes on them and they, were, they had some cans. And I'd already made a lot of assumptions about um, this group of people. Um, being a queer person, always sort of uh, being on guard and uh, being um, uh, trying trying to ensure my own safety, um, and we went to perform the work and checking with everyone to see if they were okay to uh, do a run through, and we were like, "Oh, this is going to cause a bit of trouble here." Um, but they stopped what they were doing as we were performing. They sat down and they watched the entire thing all the way through, and I felt really bad for making all those assumptions, but. Um, but it is something that uh, I have to consider when, when presenting this kind of work um, and um, when people are uh, booking and programming this kind of work as well, is how, how, do we, how do we protect? It's not always, you know, it's not always a bad thing, but yeah, how do, how do we protect and um, uh, make sure that these, these people are safe? Can you move the slide, please? Is, oh, it's me again, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Next slide. Um, so these images are from a work of mine. They're quite small, I guess. Um, from a work called Lock In, which was part of a series of performances called Suspended Islands that I produced um, along with Oirana Moraes. Um, so this was one of the performances where the audience uh, was on boats. It was during the in between lockdowns, so we had to be creative and how we um, keep our audience safe. Um, so the audience uh, was on boats and viewed, um, went through the canal in Aveiro in Portugal um, and outside of the city uh, to, to experience different performances. Um, and I'm bringing in this work mainly as an example for the work that I do before the performance. A lot of um, my considerations of safety have to do with the preparations. So, as mentioned, I work in um, this specifically was a very non-conventional space. It's in the lock for boats, so where boats have to leave the river and go into the, the sea. Um, and it's a space that is um, very male-dominated, um, and that art doesn't really happen there in general. And so, a lot of um, I spent there two weeks going familiarizing myself with the space, and most of the work was actually just um, communicating to the people who were working there and, and making them feel safe with me being in, in their 
their space and me feeling safe to, to test and, and explore and make um, work that made sense in that context. Um, and touching on what uh, May was saying in terms of um, safety of, of bodies in spaces, um, as a female presenting body working in industrial spaces, I am confronted many times with certain assumptions of what I can or cannot do um, and, um, and have to sort of jump a lot of hurdles to even have my voice um, heard or considered. And um, so yeah, so when we were talking about safety and identities, um, this element came up a lot in terms of how um, it meets me in my processes of working. Yes, you can go on for the next slide. Um, so uh, we are back to Quarin. It's the same work again. <laughs> um, but this time it has more people involved. So in 2022, that was last year. So last year, um, I received some funding from the Arts Council in Wales to expand the work Quarin into a larger production um, for six people, which is um, the traditional number of people you would normally see folk dance, in, in, a, in a Welsh folk dance. And um, with uh, expanding Quarin um, came a lot more challenges. <laughs> um, and I became very aware of uh, the, the people that was uh, part of the production and part of the project with me as an, um, as an artist. Um, and um, coming to the realization of a, a feeling of responsibility and a responsibility for their safety. And I think what I want to touch upon today is how do we, um, as a freelance maker, um, the challenges um, that uh, I, I face when creating work by, like by myself and how to ensure the safety of others, um, not being linked to an organization um, or having an infrastructure in place um, to be able to support the people that I need to be able to support. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about this recently, especially with touring internationally, and um, I think I'm just um, offering this as something to think about, but how, how, how do we support independent artists that employ other people um, and uh, go about creating policies and procedures for uh, safety um, for, and um, to keep people, um, yeah, to, to, to make sure that everyone feels supported um, within, within that uh, environment. Um, and it's something that I've, um, uh, as, I've said, as, as I said earlier, I haven't been making work for a very long time, so um, I'm learning a lot of things as I go, and um, these are uh, questions and these are uh, challenges that I'm currently facing as I uh, get offered um, opportunities. Um, and that's something else in terms of when do you uh, accept opportunities that are offered to you, um, even though you might not feel fully prepared. Um, and that's uh, quite difficult at times as um, an independent artist and um, wanting, obviously, to make the most of um, the opportunities that are given to you, but without the support and without the support uh, structure and network around you, um, like how, how do you go about um, pursuing uh, and presenting your work, um, even though you're you're facing all these all these barriers, like how how can how can we how can we help that as as a as a, as a sector really? Um, so this is a work called Tired Out. It's a one woman street show. Um, me and five tires. Um, the concept of the show is that I, every place I go, I only have one tire that is consistent with me, and I meet mechanics from the local um, place. I come a few days before, and I collect tires and have this an encounter um, with a group of people I wouldn't have before. And um, they're always invited, but they never come, or not yet, at least. Um, and this work has a participatory element to it, so in the second half of the 
show audiences invited. Um, there's a, a game with the tires, and um, and I and I brought this example as well as um, again a female body working with an object that is it's circular, yes, so it could have a feminine uh, connotations, but it it is in a world that is um, not usually um, inhabited by many women, and so. Um, also, the process of making this work and the process of always uh, presenting it, it is a constant confrontation um, with, with um, identity and feeling safe in certain spaces. And to touch on what May was saying, also as a freelance, uh, I work mainly as a solo artist. And so there's also a lot of, um, there's this constant work of, of um, how would you say this? Yeah, there's no infrastructure that is um, representing you or supporting you. And I experience a lot in festivals as well that there's um, and people who are in companies, so they have a sort of support system and, and they go off. And as a solo artist, it really doesn't exist. So actually, my experience of, of festivals is quite uh, lonely, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you, how do you also um, support, how to create um, support for individual dependent artists um, and that they feel safe to continue doing their work. Um, yes, yeah. that was what I wanted to say about this work. Yeah, yeah I think I've, well, I've got a little, maybe an anecdote that maybe reflects a little bit about mm. what we've been talking about. Um, so I recently um, came to a festival in Lorient in Brittany and um, uh, being presented with an opportunity uh, to um, had my work at an amazing festival that I've always wanted to perform at, um, but then not really knowing how to, how to, um, who, who to go to for support in terms of uh, all the logistical elements of everything. And I ended up driving a 12-seater minibus with uh, all my dancers in the back um, out. And uh, although everything went well and... Um, uh, Look, people, people did feel safe and supported. I think it's also really important in that scenario when I when I arrived home, like how what I I don't think I felt safe. So whole, as as a person holding responsibility for those people, um, I think it's really important for um, us to ensure whoever that person is um, to have a uh, support network of your own to ensure that you're you're also being taken care of and um, feel, feel safe to be carrying, carrying these yeah. um, activities out, yeah. Yeah, and before we move on to the next slide, also to um, touch on, we'll talk about it more in relation to the next works, but um, as I mentioned, there is an element here of in including the audience, inviting the audience into the work, and, um, and a lot of the creation process was also considering how do you invite people into the work mm -hmm. and how do you make them feel comfortable and not put on the spot necessarily as, um, as can happen many times. Um, yes, so that was also something in relation to safety. Yes. Oh yeah, next slide please, thank you. Um, so this is a work I created uh, this year, this summer, for the National Dance Company of Wales. Um, it's called uh, ENED, and it is a, spa uh, a work for the indoors, which is um, uh, the, f the first work that I made for the indoors. <laughs> um, and um, this came with uh, a, a different set of challenges. Um, but I think what I want to talk about is um, the sort of the themes and ideas that I like to work with in general are themes around um, culture, around identity, and most importantly, building a sense of community. Um, and uh, I think when when a work uh, w working when a work does that successfully, um, and if you if you can create an environment in the in the performance itself where um, people feel accepted and included um, no, matter, no matter who you are, um, then that, uh, that also um, sort of bleeds out in, into the audience and um, making, making them feel um, that they're also a part of, of what you're doing. Mm. Um, but I know we've been, we've been chatting a little bit about indoor spaces and um, 
Yes, and I think you had something interesting to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can go, I guess, to the next slide, please. So um, this is um, the most recent work I did in the context of um, my master's program, which I just um, completed. Um, and also it was indoor space, so very new territory for me. Um, I built a, structure, a space within the space, um, so this large uh, six by seven transparent uh, cube made out of fabric. Um, and the audience actually can't really see, I realize, with these lights, but um, the audience was invited to put on these um, transparent raincoats, so everyone was wearing the same um, costume, I guess, as me and my collaborator um, were wearing. And, um, and I was very curious in this work to, um, to think about um, what is seen and what is not seen. Um, yeah, about, I was exploring the idea of transparency, but also what assumptions we hold um, and uh, what we think we see and what we actually see. Um, and this was also one of the first works I had a, a collaborator with me on stage. So in the process as well, thinking about how to, um, it, it's a, um, he's a musician, his name is Pedro, and um, he's usually a musician, so he's in the background doing his thing, not really as a performer, or he doesn't think of himself as a performer. And so the process of incorporating him into the work uh, involved a lot of um, communication and, and understanding his boundaries and, and what, is, what are my needs or what, are the, what is the work's needs and how to, how to respect that and how to find a, a middle ground for us both to work in. And also how to um, create a space where the audience comes in and they feel, they feel safe and comfortable to put on this, this costume. They, they, didn't, they weren't informed before. Um, so that, that came across a lot in this particular work. Yeah, I was yeah. want to pick up on the word comfortable there, actually, because mm. um, we've been having a lot of discussions around comfort um, and relating safety to comfort, mm -hmm. um, which, is, um, which is something that, that is important and is, and is, and is, uh, and is relevant to, to feeling safe or having, creating a safe space. Um, but as artists, our work um, uh, is, is to provoke or is to make people think differently or um, to, to challenge people in different ways through our artwork. Um, so uh, in that sense, there is an element of um, uh, per perhaps being uncomfortable. Um, and one of the points I wanted to bring up today is the, um, the importance of of that and for us to keep pushing, um, pushing people to think differently and uh, to provoke um, with what we, what we make. Um, so the question I have really is how do, we, how do you create a safe space for people to feel discomfort? Mm -hmm. um, and how do, we, yeah, how, how, do we, how do we create a space where people can feel safe to feel a range of different emotions um, and um, that comfort doesn't always equate, equate to safety. Mm. Um, yeah. And also how to um, be able to yeah, create a, a, a safe space where um, yeah, not only feelings of discomfort can be felt, but also can be spoken about. Uh, we, um, mm. Both as freelance artists, I think it came up as well as, as being um, uh, confronted or in situations where there is a certain um, imbalance, hierarchical imba imbalance, economic imbalance, um, and how, how do we navigate those spaces or how can we communicate um, um, it, discomfort while also not worrying about the safety of our future as well. So sometimes you don't say something because you're worried maybe that will imply not being able to collaborate again in the future. So um, in relation to discomfort also, it, thinking about how to cultivate a way of communicating um, sensation, uncomfortable topics um, while not uh, worrying about the safety of, the, yeah, of your work. Safety is uh, something that would 
it's always changing as well. So we've mm -hmm. like um, through these conversations, the meaning the meaning of the word safety is is constantly changing. It's never it's never one thing at one particular time. And um, what makes us feel safe today might not be the, the case in a year's time. So these conversations are important to um, to have, but also to keep having them um, as as the meaning of of safety will 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 always not not be not be the same. Yeah. So as Mary said in the beginning, what we shared or what we're sharing with you now is just a a window or a peephole into our dialogue that we also just met in the context of this um, event. And so um, we start, we invite you for the next day or just to continue conversations about what safety means to you and understand that that also changes per context and that, yeah, and discover what that means. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I want to just also to thank the interpreters for translating and again for Circus Strada uh, for inviting us today and for listening. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you. Hello, this was the artistic talk of Daria Ifrat and Ocean Meleir. We are still in Bagneux, le plus petit cirque du monde, and there will be another performance for the audience, but uh, as you cannot see it, I wanted to be with uh, an artist that will perform this afternoon, because you know, this afternoon and during the fresh, these fresh days, there are performances, so uh, welcome to you, Mathias. Hello. Mathias Lyon. I will ask if you can to talk like me, not very loudly. All right. Okay. Not to disturb okay. the performance. I'll do this. You perform with a horse. With, with a horse, yeah. I'm a writer and a hip hop dancer. Wow. So uh, I'm doing this since I'm uh, 17. I was a writer in a company called uh, Zingaro. Very well known company. Yeah. And uh, so this is my first show that I. Uh, build it myself, and it's called the uh, Sol Duel. You are alone, but I'm together. A, yeah, and that, that's the subject of my show, actually. It, it, it's a ceremony that's half urban, half uh, rural, and that shows this uh, relation between a rider and his horse. And as this relation can be very sensitive, very emotional, and it also can be uh, somewhere violent, like uh, in every time you meet someone else. Yes, it can be violent. Do you get along with your horse? Uh, That's his name. His Tell name us is, a little bit. His name is Bubastis. He's a Spanish horse that I met uh, two years ago. So he he was uh, he was in a suburb of Marseille, and uh, uh, he was he he was. Uh, with a, a guy that was uh, uh, that had uh, how do you say cock uh, uh, cock uh, uh, um, cock chicken uh, uh, fight birds yeah he, fight, he birds. fight chicken fight birds. that we don't eat that they fight so it was yes. a guy that that had fight birds in the uh, and he in in the middle of all of, all of these birds there was this horse and, uh, it's a very violent environment very violent environment and it was a, a violent horse at this moment but it's not anymore. How did you do? Uh, well, weren't you scared? Was it safe? Uh, it was uh, actually that's why I, I bought him. It's because it was safe. I, I've seen in him that I was going to be able to talk with him. Uh, but it's very simple and very technical. It's work of every day. That's how you build a relation with a horse. It's, it's the every day you come to see him and you work with him, and little by little, it's a very long relation that you have to to build uh, uh, on a very long time. Uh, then, then you can obtain some some things. Do you think there is something to learn from this experience you have with your horse than the experience you can have with uh, human beings? Yeah, of course. Uh, that's how I, I, I live, actually. Uh, uh, meeting a horse was, for me, a way to, to encounter my own body. 
Like, uh, I, I've, first of all, I've been a writer, then I became a dancer. And uh, it's actually, uh, I, I started to ride horses because my father is uh, half uh, Native American. Mm -hmm. And so it was a way for him to, sh to show me his culture because I, I lived in France, in the suburb of France, and, and there was no contact with this culture. And so uh, with the horse came a whole imaginary. And, uh, and this imaginary, uh, with this, I, I encountered dance. And, uh, and it's, it's this culture that I've never met that, that melted these two practices, dance and, uh, and horse riding. Mm -hmm. We can listen to some human screamings yeah. <laughs> behind us. It's a two-man duet. And there are, maybe you can see, can, can you tell us a little bit, Mathias Lyon, if you stand up, can you describe the dance because you're a dancer? The dance that the two guys do? Well, they, they jump all over the place and, and on classical music. And sometimes it looks a bit like a fight or, or, or lose. Sometimes they fall. But it seems to be kind of funny. <laughs> do you know them? Do you know them? Do you know these no, artists? No, I don't know them. I don't know them. But per probably I know someone who knows them. Of course. <laughs> so it's a duet like you and your horse. Yeah, well... Uh, Our horse, horse is funny. Is it able to laugh with the horse? You. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know if it's good words for a, a relation with horse. Actually, uh, uh, words are not made for horses. And so their emotions and their way to behave is uh, is it's not in this language uh, actually when you meet a horse the language that you develop with him if you want to ride him it's a, a language of the contact it's uh, by touching him by when you ride him you it's a uh, it's your back on on on, on him it's uh, your hands on his mouth it's uh, your your feet and so uh, it's like this that you meet him and this contact can be very sensitive because horses have a skin really uh, more sensitive than ours uh, but it can also be very very strong and uh, and it can be violent because it it's a 500 kilos animal yes and you are uh, <laughs> on, on the a bit, less. <laughs> a bit less so uh it's two years out how, how did the, the relationship uh, progress uh, you told me it's your first performance uh, called seul due yeah and even if uh, places like festival are a safe place to present the work, you still told me I, I was a bit scared. Like it's always, uh, even if it's in a festival, you can be always scared to present a work. How yeah, would well, be uh, the ideal place to do or like to do? There, there's no... Well, uh, that, that's the, the subject of, of, my, of my work. Uh, when you bring a horse in a city, when you're bringing a horse in a place to do a show, it is not done for him. And so, uh, and it's an animal that can have reactions very important. Morris is very young. It's the beginning of his work. And that's what I wanted. It's, uh, actually, it, it is scary. And I have to be very careful about that. But little by little, I can do more. And uh, also, that's what what's the experience of this show, is that you see a horse that have a lot of reactions, that is very emotional, and so this is a really big part of uh, of, of the show is to to see my horse how he expresses. I, I actually it is scary, but I want to use this. I am uh, playing, not playing, but controlling, dealing, provocating. Yeah. Also, of course, yeah, yeah. You provoke your uh, horse. Ne n never too much. <laughs> never too much. But, uh, it could be dangerous for you. Um, well, it, everything can always be dangerous, uh, but I, I don't go as far as I could on a show. When you do a show, you do only things that you're that you know that works. But uh, for for the the public. It is very. It can be also uh, an experience that can be scary because I come very close with the horse, 
and uh, and you see the horse going very fast, very close from you. So uh, so I'm not I'm not the only one who who's dealing with this when, yes. in, in this show. You're playing with it in yeah. a way. Mm -hmm. Do you you have the experience of big artists on stage, and now you're alone? What what, what what do you feel? Do you feel more uh, confident when you have a lot of artists around you, or do you feel more confident when when you're alone? How do you? Um, no, well, uh, uh, I feel I, I felt really confident in this company that, that we had like uh, 30, 40 horses. Uh, we were a lot of riders, and it was uh, we could always share experiences. And uh, right now, my what I with, wanted with was Zingaro. to be in Zingaro. And yes. so right now, my what I wanted was to be alone and to work with my horse alone and to show that that's uh, like even in the title of the of the show, you you can hear this uh, this 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 subject. Sol duel. Yeah. That alone duel. Alone duel. And uh, and so, uh, what was I saying? Uh, so, so the difference between being in group in Zingaro yeah. and being uh, and, uh, alone, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in a way. So, so the first thing to say oh, is that I am not alone on this show. I have uh, 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 Julien Defay, that is someone that uh, that has a place in the show, and also uh, he's he he's a little bit like a master of ceremony. He, you know, uh, in. Uh, in in tribes when you do a, a fire ceremony there is one of the guy that uh, that doesn't do the ceremony but that takes care of the fire well that's ah. his, that's his work yes taking care so, of the fire so i'm not alone because i have him right now and uh, and that's what i encountered is it's that even in a in a relation uh, with with uh, only two people you have to be open to the other you cannot just only be two people I can. I can see there is a small talk. Let's go back to the center of the circus to listen a little bit. Stay with me, Matthias, for a few minutes. I'm just listening to. Let's go back to what. Is it okay? Um, as you know, we're going to have a little bit of a schedule question, but don't worry, everything will solve itself. We're going to be a little bit late but we will have a shorter lunch. Okay, it's just the organization. Uh, you can go everywhere with your horse, Mathias Lyon. That's what I want, yeah. Uh, the, the show is done to, to, to be uh, uh, performed in the city places or in the rural places, but what, we, what we're working on is also to do a show, but, uh, but also a global experience, actually, when you uh, when you come somewhere with a horse, you need time for him to get used to the place. And you can't travel every day with a horse. It would be too hard for him. And it would be a, just a sad life for him. So what we want to do is to take this, this time that we have to take and to use it to, to make a, an artistic performance more global. Like uh, uh, actually in, in, a, in a city, I, I can come with my horse somewhere else than uh, in the place where we do, do the show. Uh, to dance in the middle of a, a suburb, for example, or uh, I do also drawings, so I could come with my horse in the middle of a market and, and, and uh, draw somewhere. We want to create a, a whole experience around this time where we live in, it, 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 on this place, so, so a full experience with the neighbors, with all the city. Oh, great. I hope you'll travel the world like, yeah. like that. And so this afternoon... You will be perform seul duet. There is, it's raining. Well, if if we can do the show, we'll do some of these uh, performances in the PPCM. Yes, the peu, plus petit cirque. Plus petit cirque du monde. Du monde. Yeah, Thank you it. very much, uh, Mathias. This is Thank the you. the end soon of this um, morning session. It it will continue, but we won't put it on the live streaming because different panelists wanted a safe place to speak, so we respect it. Tomorrow morning, we'll meet around 10, uh, 10 local time here in uh, Paris, Central European time, for more discussion, for more question about the topic of uh, sustainability. I'm waiting for you. Follow us on the circostrada.org where you can listen to the podcast also called Around Fresh, produced by Making Moose. Thank you, Clément, from Making Waves. 
all around for streaming the sun waiting so for you tomorrow it's Odlevin reporting live from Le Plus Petit Cirque du Monde see you <laughs>